Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 189. This episode is with my new friend, Craig Lee Thomas. Not only is he hilarious and a fantastic actor, he's also just a really great hang. In this episode, we talk about how he was a child actor, what being in an action figure commercial is really like, studying the Stella Adler technique, becoming the youngest fight captain in the Utah Shakespearean Festival's history, his sketch comedy group Pursued by Bear, why he loves working on video games, and so much more. Craig is awesome, and you're going to love him. So, without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 189, with Craig Lee Thomas. Theme song time. underneath on solo this is a uh, a picture of ugwe from kung fu panda ah yes yeah. it is the ugwe meme in that case. indeed indeed uh randall duck kim was on the show prior and he and i became oh, incredible friends, and he he sent me a picture and he's like hey and i was like thanks pal oh really nice thanks for the meme thanks for the memories exact boom craig boom. we are gonna be very thanks so friends. much i appreciate it bye <laughs> <laughs> i think you're the first guest that i met at a party so that's cool Hey, that makes both of us seem cooler than we actually look are. at us. <laughs> I mean, that that creates a an illusion of what's going on here that I'm happy to try to maintain. Ditto, ditto. Cheers. Slancha, I like your uh camp mug. What does it say? Yes, thank you. It's uh ex- oh, experience, experience tradition. tradition. It's Oconee State Park that I just camped at for the first time. Amazing. Where is Oconee? Is it it is in South Carolina. South Carolina, amazing. Yeah, it was great. I'm a, I'm a big net. I'm a big park hike guy. Yeah, what's your favorite? Oh my god, um, I did, I did <gasps> Mount Whitney. You I did Mount Whitney a couple staff? years ago. Wizard stuff. Yeah, Look I got at that. some of my, some of my, some of my achievements on. Here. Oh, you got the badges on it too. Cool. This is this is when I went to Titty National Park, so that's why it's censored out. Classic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I got the into second like, highest summit. Yeah. <laughs> well, one one's a little higher than the other. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Which is okay. Into, yeah, it's to, oh, uh, yeah, preferable, really. Cool I'm into it. Now. Agreed. Exactly. Um. Yeah, I got into my buddy who is a personal trainer and much fitter than I am. Got me into um. I always like to do the LA version of hiking, which is like get an eight dollar iced coffee and go on a walk. That's what <laughs> yeah. we call hike. Um, but he got me into like climbing mountains and like going on treks and stuff. Yeah. My, my wife is very outdoorsy as well, and we have two very active dogs, so we like to take them out to hikes go. and parks and stuff. I've seen the pictures of your summiting Mount Whitney. I mean, there you go. How how long did it take you, and what what did you leave on the mountain? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> initially, a little bit of my affection for my friend, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, definitely, that was a twenty one hour total trip. Oh man. Um. Because we started at 1230 in the morning because it takes so long that you want to be in the dark as little as possible on the way back. There's two ways to do it. Okay, the normal me. three ways to do it. The, Got it. The normal way would be like um, s- start summiting. There is a lake sort of at the base of what's called the 99 switchbacks. Cool. Most people hike up name. to there. Can- oh, it is a great name. Until you realize, oh, there are fucking 99 of these fuckers. <laughs> um, most people, you camp there, you hang out, and then the next morning, very early, 99 switchbacks, about another two miles on the spine of the mountain range, and then you mm-hmm. summit, Whitney. We were maniacs and didn't feel like camping, so there is a way. If you start early <laughs> oh, enough, no. you can just go and just not stop and do the entire thing. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, God, what is it? I think like... Six or seven thousand. I mean, I'm gonna get roasted if any <laughs> statistics are wrong, but whatever. Six or seven thousand feet of vertical climbing. I think you go cool. from like eight, eight to fourteen five, which is way altitude sickness range. Oh, no. um, did you? Yeah, you do. It's yeah. just about how bad it hits you. Ah, um, uh, got it. And weirdly enough, it's not a. It's not necessarily about fitness. Like I okay. was probably the least 
fit person of the five people that I was hiking with. I was in I was okay. in good shape. I, I'd been training for it for months, but like smart, everybody else was in better shape than me and, and a little bit lighter. I was kind of clonking along in the back with that uh-huh. big ass self. But <laughs> it's about it's about physiology. It hits different people differently. My buddy, who is uh-huh. the most physically fit guy I know, started getting housed at like thirteen thousand feet. Oh, where no. I was like, I feel like shit, but I'm like, I'm okay. I can keep going. And it's just about blood oxygen or like the way that sure. you process it it doesn't necessarily have to do with like it's helpful if you're in good shape but altitude sickness either hits you really bad or it doesn't oh did you know that going in we did uh my buddy okay, and i good. um morgan west who's a actor and a personal trainer here in um here in la who's fantastic um we were aware of the altitude sickness thing and we started <laughs> taking what what google was telling us was basically not going to work but we were like yeah. placebo effect placebo effect this thing called acclimate which is okay. like really shitty tasting high C in a powder form. That's like, <laughs> oh, it's got ginkgo and ginseng and vitamin C and it's supposed to help. Sure. And ibuprofen as well. So we were like okay. chasing Advil with this drink. And by Boom. the time we got to like 10 or 11,000 feet, we were we were so sick of drinking it that we were <laughs> taking dry shots and chasing it with water there just to go. get it into our system and get it over with. <laughs> and it True maybe fitness. helped. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, uh, hashtag hashtag grind mindset, hashtag right. fit life, hashtag I mean, rise and grind. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. I'm better now with you. Look at this. Look it at happened. That. Look at us. All Look we had us. to do was put a little blackmail in, and then yeah. it happens. How is my daughter, by the way? She is safe for now. We will check in in an hour, like I said. I could hear the air quotes around that yep. word. Mm-hmm. Safe. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Tread lightly. Uh, so <laughs> I always do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's your LA thing. I know you're not from LA though. No, uh, I was born in New Jersey, um, mm-hmm. but don't hold that against me. <laughs> and um, not too much longer after I moved to uh, Northeast Pennsylvania, um, a little town outside of Wilkes Barre would be like the great next name. biggest town. It is killing it, it you know, today. Just it is a great oh, name. Wilkes Barre is a great name. If you're from Wilkes Barre, you say it wrong. That's how you know you're from Wilkes Barre. Because uh, it's Wilkes Barre, but if you're from Wilkes Barre, you say Wilkes Barre. Oh, so that's not, always... I, not where I thought we were going with that. Yeah, it's W I L. Oh, Jesus, W I L K E S hyphen B A R R E. I believe it's the names of oh, two people. Wilkes Barre. Got it. But if you're from Wilkes Barre, you say Wilkes Barre. Interesting. Um, Scranton would be the next biggest town. Which I know that one. Yes, everybody knows that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, lots of paper. Lots of paper up in yep. Scranton. Um, I will, I will say, um, uh, the intro video, like that, that yeah. like John Krasinski shot on his phone, like very cool. Cause all those places you're like, oh shit. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, that's that. That's that. And the production design in the art department and the set, um, the set decorators on that show, like really, yeah. really did an amazing job. Like it's not just like the lip servicey, like oh, we'll slip this in. We'll we'll look up a restaurant name. Like things that they never reference or mention are just in the background. Like that's cool. There are, there are froggy one hundred and one stickers on like <laughs> yeah. Phyllis's desk. It's like oh shit, that's the country station. Like in Wilkes-Barre. Yeah. Oh my god, that's that. They they talk about Cooper Seafood. You know, it's like lots cool. of little things that they did a pretty good job with. That's very satisfying to be like. I know that thing. Yeah. <laughs> and That's yeah, it cool. is. It's full of weirdos um, as well. So I think that, yeah, definitely. The best place. Yeah. It definitely, it definitely fit that bill. But yeah, okay. Nepo is a good place to be from, I would say. Yeah. That's like how I describe it. Like sure. I grew up kind of in like, my wife makes fun of me because I'm like, oh yeah, I kind of grew up in the sticks. And she's like, you grew up in a development. <laughs> Your development had a name. It had a sign. And I'm like, you're you're not wrong. There is like a little. <laughs> it was a sticky a li- one. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a sticky wicket. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think my my dad has the best summation of where we live. We are from the edge of nowhere. Okay, the middle of nowhere is further in. We're Got towards it. somewhere, but still on the edge of nowhere. That's the so sweet like, spot. That's what you want. The, it is the sweet spot. You drive by the dairy farm to get to my parents' house, but then like you know they live in a development. Like, got it. Okay, I went to the rural high school for sure. Like, yeah. The country. There you the go. Country public school, like, you know, tractors in the parking lot, lots of pickups. You Love know, it. Anytime it snowed, which it snowed all the time, like, you usually had the track. Are you from Florida originally? Uh, I'm originally from North Carolina. 
Okay, so you had snow days then. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. you know the joys of a two hour delay. Yeah, just anything to not be at school. Pretty much anything to not be at school. <laughs> and I th- I think I think we're both elder millennial enough to remember the crawl. Yeah, at the bottom of the screen. Oh, mm-hmm. watching the news the night before, praying mm-hmm. that your letter would come around. Yep. <laughs> so lots of that small public high school. Um. Which was it, it was it was nice, you know. Um, I enjoyed it while I was there. I went K through twelve with like the same ninety or a hundred okay. other people, like really small classes. Like, well, yeah, we went to kindergarten together in this building, and then we went to middle school in this building, and then we went to high school over there, all like in the same sort of oh, cool. quarter mile area. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was it was it was interesting. It was an interesting <laughs> interesting upbringing. Um, not a lot of like. I mean, no diversity at all. Like, sure, of course. Northeast Pennsylvania in the '90s is just like Checks a very, out. very homogenized, like very homogenized community. Yeah, um, just like not milk. a very. Yeah, exactly. Hey, mm-hmm. listen, we could talk about milk all day. Milk is like my entire personality. <laughs> um, but God, like, not a very well funded school. Sure. Um, the MLEB is what we call their middle school, the middle level education building. Nice. And years before, I think in like the late '80s or early '90s a gas station exploded across the street what? from the middle school. <laughs> like That's awesome. Do. Yeah. I, I, I went to, <laughs> I went to Jan Michael Vincent high. So it's just like eighties action Amazing. movie set pieces <laughs> happening, you know? Um, but I think they, they had this fire at a gas station and like all the tankers leaked and like leached gasoline into the groundwater. Oh, so we were instructed. Don't wash your hands for too long. <laughs> no. Okay, that's a great thing to say to a bunch of grubby little twelve-year prepubescent right? twelve-year-olds. You, <laughs> the the water fountains were all like locked off, and the gas company was like legally bound to provide us with like bubblers, like water coolers, because the water was still leached with gasoline and like what? it smelled bad. And for some reason, we still went to school there for yeah. <laughs> years. Um, Where are you going to learn these things, Craig? Exactly. Um, the year after I left, the building was condemned and I believe demolished because they found asbestos in it as well. So um, it's nice. It's nice that I snuck this podcast in before my death at yeah, the yeah, age yeah. of 38. You know? That's why like, we're here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's record so, yeah. of life. <laughs> it, it is just like once upon a time there was this guy and it was yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, yeah, you know, like it, it was it was nice. I, I, I'm a big proponent of public school and like public education, you know? like. I got a good, I got a good education. We we had good teachers. We had a couple teachers that really gave a shit, and cool. like, that's enough to get you through. And I had good friends, mm-hmm. and um, you know, much to my parents' chagrin, I did decide to eventually try to play a sport, which yeah. <laughs> freaked them out. I had like a very, um, God, I don't know, I don't know how to begin to explain myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to figure myself out. <laughs> well, exactly. Maybe, maybe maybe by the end of it, we'll have some idea of what yeah. going on. Yeah. What here. sport was it? Uh, I played volleyball, uh, okay. which was a okay. grand old time. Yeah, weirdly enough, my little I, – I, I believe at the time maybe like Pennsylvania, I think maybe New Jersey, Arizona, California, maybe a couple other states mm-hmm. were the states that had boys volleyball okay. as opposed to – because I've met a lot of people from all over the country like, you played volleyball in high school? That's weird because a lot of people only had a girls team, right. I guess, because of like, um, you know, the way that Title IX worked out in terms of like sure. having enough slots – but for whatever reason, we had a really like strong boys mm. volleyball program at my high school. And my uh, my best friend, Corey, really wanted to play because he had gotten sick of basketball. So I was like, hey, I'll give this a try. And as I said, like I I was an arts kid from like day one. Like I yeah. was doomed. Um, there was kind of <laughs> there's kind of no chance for me. My parents like met doing Twelfth Night in college. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. My Sealed mom the deal. Was, yeah, exactly. My mom was a music teacher and a church musician. Oh, cool. Um, and my dad was, um, I believe he was like an English scenic design major before he had, he ran out of money and had to drop out and just like, oh, yeah, that, my mom. that makes an actor. Yeah. That math yeah, checks yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> ah, the arts. Yes. And then he went into, he went into it for his career. But I mean, we grew up, I did community theater from like the age of four on. Um, really? That's like the other, that's the other nice thing about NEPA, um, Northeast PA. Like it's a strange little coal community sure but there's lots of art like i think like whatever whatever like 20th century immigrant immigrant population came in like there's lots of 
choral music and there's lots of or orchestral music and there's a lot of theater and a lot of like that kind of stuff going yeah. on for for an area that isn't that populated i guess it's close enough to a couple major cities too so it gets a little bit of that runoff but sure my entire life was just spent like you know go to school come home have dinner go to play rehearsal like go sit in really? a really in the music box dinner playhouse in swoyersville pennsylvania this little like salt box in this little row house sort of neighborhood um right off the highway and just sitting in the back surrounded by adults chain smoking <laughs> marlboros of course and, of course and drinking beer as we're like putting up fiddler on the roof yeah <laughs> as you do yeah, like you do and <laughs> and yeah you know like you only know what's normal I guess you don't know what's not normal until you go to college or you meet people outside your community. And that was like right. one of the many things like, oh, this is, uh, oh, that, oh, okay. This is not, this, <laughs> it's not normal that like my best friend is a 38 year old guy named Ron, <laughs> right. you know, <laughs> who like spent most of the nineties following the Grateful Dead. It's like that, that shouldn't be my best friend. Sure. And, like the only person I want to talk to. Cool. Yeah. Never mind. You shouldn't be a pack a day as a freshman. Yeah. And, and, you I, know, obviously. I feel you. Yeah. I feel yeah, you. I, I, I didn't start ripping off the filters until middle school. I yeah. figured the, the is best. You have to have now. some class. I get yes, it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, all, all things in moderation. Yes. Um, as if we knew what that meant. Yeah. It's I, all or nothing over here. I don't know why. I'm just wired that way. I either love something or I'm entirely apathetic. I'm a big, if it ain't broke, don't fix it guy too. Like, yeah. I'm, Ditto. I'm a big routine person. I'm definitely like a yeah. order the same thing at the restaurant every single time same? I go. Yeah. Very much so. I, if I find one thing, I will order it until they take it off the menu. Yeah, and please don't because it's my thing. Don't do it. Have you had that happen? I, I remember less items getting taken off versus like pl places closing and that oh, being such a such a worse. bummer. There's this place. It was either on 3rd or Beverly here in L.A. It was called Doughboys on this Ooh. really cool little block of like there's like a Verve coffee and a bunch of cool little shops and stuff. Doughboys was like a little, it was a little bakery slash sort of diner, but it had like a it had a fun kind of pseudo Eastern European kind of thing to its dinery food. So like they had like really good goulash and they had like oh. a beefy mac and cheese that kind of felt like Hungarian and stew like. But they had um, SOS. Oh, my God. Have you ever had SOS shit on a shingle? No. <laughs> I, I, now I, I feel like I'm missing out. I know. Right. I think it's an old army thing because there, there's a million different variations of it, but this was just like two kind of stale toasted pieces of bread covered in soft eggs and like a meat sauce basically so it looks awful it looks yeah. like it was scraped out of <laughs> yeah. the bottom of like a bucket but oh my god ridiculously insanely stupidly delicious oh. and yeah before the pandemic even i think some landlord you know bullshit happened with the building and they couldn't keep their lease up and now it's some boring you know Ugh. like designer Rest clothing store or something yeah r.i.p doughboys r.i.p doughboys we miss you and your red velvet cupcakes <sighs> they go too soon they do go too soon but you know luckily you know plenty of plenty of good places to eat <laughs> yeah LA. thank goodness so did you decide at four you wanted to do theater or were your parents like, let's stick him here and see what happens? That's a great question uh, that is posed by my therapist all the time. I mean, what? <laughs> um, honestly, like, I, th I think I think it was equal measure because, yeah. like, I know my parents really wanted me to mm -hmm. do it. But I also know that I wanted to, too. And I, I remember having conversations with them about, you know, like wanting to choose different things, but like. <laughs> Let, let's open up the other Pandora's box. In Here addition to doing community theater as a kid, I was also like a kid actor, like in New York. Oh yeah, I um, may have seen quite a few things. Oh Christ Almighty! <laughs> um, I was debating whether or not to pull things up for context, but now don't worry, I'm, we're get we're just, going there. We could just avoid that. Walt but should yeah. have warned you. <laughs> God damn it, Walt! I forgot to get I forgot I forgot to get like a little post mortem slash like. Preparation. He's too. He's too busy getting married and being yeah, yeah, and with his living his best life, life and all exactly. that nonsense. Exactly. LBL. LBL. Yeah. LBL. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like I was shuttled to New York two to three times a week by my mom for auditions from like age four until like age fifteen. Wow. Like, that, okay. That was like that was like what I did. Um, she would pick pick me up from school. It's about 125 miles to Manhattan, so like two and a half hours. 
Mm -hmm. drive in, do an audition, drive home. Whew. And that, that and you was liked like, it? I did. I, I did. I really, I really Good. did enjoy it. Yeah. I think um I was enough of an indoor kid that I liked having a lot of time to read. Sure. I think if I, I think literally if my inner ear had been different, I don't think I would have been a kid actor because I, I when I was a kid, I could read in the car. Sure. Or play like Game Boy in mm -hmm. the car and not get car sick. And I think if I hadn't done that, it would have been so boring. Right. It would have been like, we got to stop doing this. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> But yeah, like I would miss combined like between like 30 and 40 days of school a year. Dude. Because I was going back and forth to the city so much. Um, but yeah, did a lot of commercials. Um, that's actually when I first started doing voiceover um, when I was a kid. Uh, Makes sense. I think my New Jersey birth, Pennsylvania upbringing canceled out my accent a little bit. Oh. <laughs> I remember like my manager like said, oh yeah, like you, you, you're you going to do this, you're going to do this. Cause like, yeah, you, you come in, you're the only kid who isn't like, Hey, yeah. Campbell soup. Yeah. Capri sun liquid. Cool. Like I, <laughs> right, I guess yeah. everybody else sounded like a newsie because <laughs> right. they were, you know, in Manhattan and they were actor kids. And I was like relatively neutral. Sure. Um, But yeah, that was like my main activity, which I think, it it was fun. It was it was enjoyable. I liked being on set, and I liked I liked yeah. meeting people. I liked being in the city. I liked the energy of the city. I think I responded to that. Um, and it was it was enjoyable. I got to do a lot of cool stuff. You know, yeah. Um, I met James Earl Jones when I was like so six or cool. seven years old, it, doing a Bell Atlantic commercial, The Heart of Communication. Um, dude, dude. Uh, yeah, I got to go to. I went to San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. God, I think. Oh, I should have, I should have, this is 25 th years ago. So who fucking knows? I think, <laughs> I know. I think, the, I think the guy's name was Jim Sheridan. Some big movie it is director. Now. Well, it is now. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that, that's canon. Um, yeah. <laughs> we did a Coca-Cola commercial out in San Francisco and like. I've seen it. Took surf <laughs> lessons, hung out in Half Moon Bay. Like. Really? Well, I got to do a lot of cool stuff. It was, it was, it was fun. It was fun and interesting for sure. And I was obviously the only person I knew. Yeah, who was doing sure. anything like that? Um, but I think it was so it was so weird that like it didn't resonate or land at all at really? home or at school. Like I remember like being like a shitty teenager and thinking back to being a shitty pre teenager and having yeah. like <laughs> shitty egotistical thoughts. Like, why am I not cool? Like, <laughs> I feel like if Phil Carrillo was doing this, like right. he would be the coolest guy because he already was like a very handsome, cool guy in my class. I hate him. I know. Fuck that guy. He was. Um, yeah, the he, worst. He, he, that that was the worst thing about Phil Carrillo. He was a nice guy. Yeah, Damn it, even Phil, worse. Square jaw and a nice guy. Yeah, but I remember thinking, like, how is how how does how do people not care about this? Why am I still being right. shoved into lockers? Why do girls Been not there. want to talk to me? Yep, one hundred percent. Yep. Um, and I think it was just so alien and so foreign that people were like, "Oh yeah, he's gone a lot. Yeah, <laughs> right. he doesn't. He doesn't. Well, and it's like he doesn't do anything. Like he's not present in this class. Like it in doesn't any go way. past that. You're like, yeah, he's what's not he going away to do cool yeah. stuff. They're like, yeah, uh, he's just like, not uh, here. Fuck that guy. Who cares? Kids um, are the worst. <laughs> kids are the worst. But uh, but I also can't blame them because it's like you know. Mm -hmm. I wasn't around, so right. why give a shit about me? I was <laughs> yeah. never, I was just like a kind of nerdy, mouthy, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> compensating for my own insecurities, overly precocious, petulant little shit. So, right. Were you care? tall? Did you get tall? Short? I got like tall. Early? I got tall late. I think that okay. was, the, that was the other thing. Um, I, I, I must, I think I grew five or six inches in high school. Like, Ooh. I bloomed really late and I got tall fast, which is not fun. <laughs> I bet. That's an that's an unfun couple of like it is stretching in your sleep. Yeah, it really it really is. It's like it's like a cliche, but I, I remember vividly like not being able to sleep as a kid, just like pain in your hips and in your knees yeah. and in your back. And then you're like, Oh, I was growing. We're what a Isn't that weird... gross and weird? It's super fucking weird. Why it's... is our bodies like that? It's really, really strange. I, I, I want to go into just the Captain America pod and just open the yeah. door and be like, "Hello, I'm done." Like, yeah, I have cooked. Yeah, exactly. Done. More of like yeah. an insta, an instapot kind of yeah. thing would be nicer than agreed. The I think something about learning. I was like, let's just matrix this stuff. Plug it back in. Cool. I know I can fly a helicopter now. Whoa, like I know algebra two. Yeah. If only. 
<laughs> I know that would be nice. Um, Oof. but yeah, I mean, I think that's that's part of the reason why um I wanted to do uh I wanted to play volleyball. I think in high school because like up until then I had I had I had had a whole community of like being in choral society and doing community theater and stuff outside of school, sure. and I just felt like. I have I, I have friends and I'm cool when I'm doing pajama game, <laughs> but like, right? <laughs> and then I'm in school and everybody's like, "Shut the fuck up, nerd!" Just like housing right. me across the hall, like this is a disconnect. I don't like this. I was like, I right. need to, I need I need to figure this out. Um, so when I when I got to high school, I was like, yeah, like, like me and like all my friends, like let's let's play volleyball. And I remember very, I remember distinctly just getting the feeling from my parents like. It, the opposite of the thing like sure. if I had been a jock and I was like I want to be in the play it would have been a similar just like befuddled disappointed what? response just like <laughs> what they came they came to enjoy it and be, they were very supportive of it eventually but I think it just it kind of freaked them out like yeah um my wife was the opposite she was a huge jock um uh -huh. and then when she got into high school she started to do speech and debate and her dad who was like also like a very athletic guy um coached mm -hmm. a lot of her and her sister's teams and stuff he always talked about like I hated going to the speech and debate tournaments because you know Lisa would not do as well as somebody else, or one of Lisa's friends would not do as well as somebody. And I'd be like, but they were better. And Lisa had to be like, <laughs> like, well, it's subjective. Like it was the opinion of the judges, and that like really stuck in his craw because he was very used to like, well, it was sixty to fifty eight, we right? Won. Well, it was forty to thirty, we lost. And I think my parents were the opposite. They're like, they never got nervous for me watching me do a play watching me do oh. a musical watching me sing or do any of that but like the comp the competitive aspect of yeah. volleyball just like they were so not used to it that sure it just like, like, I'm, I'm, I'm too nervous i'm like it's a it's a game it's a game it's fine like we'll win or we won't it's no big deal but like right. I, th I think they were not that, that that's not in their like oeuvre sure of experience and it was a new thing for them to get used to i think which they eventually sense. did and were and were very supportive of but that's cool. But I'm glad it made me a little bit more normal. I think like, yeah, quote unquote, I, it, it was nice to be really terrible at something. I think it's <laughs> yeah. like I had set myself up to just do all the nerdy, musically artistic -y things my whole life. Yeah. And then finally it was like, oh, I suck at this. I am <laughs> uncoordinated and slow and not good. And that was I think that was good. I think it salts you up a little bit. And it also yeah. just like losing a tough game really does make it just like, hey, let, not even that life's not fair, but like, hey, sometimes shit doesn't work out. Yeah. And, it, and it's it's best that you strategize to figure <laughs> yeah. out how to get on top of that. And also sure. just like, you know, made a lot of good friends, you know, being on a team, being on a team with people, I think really is um, it is impactful. I was able to like get to know a lot of guys in my school. Sure. And become a per become a person in a way that maybe I wasn't before. That's cool. A nice. way to like join your community. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. A way to a way to participate a little more. And then um um I was a I was a sophomore um in two thousand one. Um mm -hmm. I was supposed to be in the city on uh, September eleventh, but the audition like got moved or got canceled or something. Ooh. Thank goodness. Um and after that, I think um I think a couple things happened. I think the industry obviously slowed down for for a while it obviously understandable everything, everything took such a big hit with such a fucking devastating awful thing i think also i was starting to enjoy being in my high school a little bit more being in my community a little bit more sure. and also frankly like i i i just not nobody wanted to look at me at age 14 <laughs> 15 like puberty was not kind um i was definitely not weird looking enough to be the weird kid and nowhere near good looking enough to be anything else so i think like the industry also was just like well i don't know what to do with you and i i kind of stopped after sure. that and i was able to kind of finish out high school just like just being in school which i'm also okay. really i'm grateful for which was nice but you know also grateful for all those experiences it's a lot of weird shit to post on instagram and yeah. freak people out and um, I was able to pay. I was able to pay for school. I never would have been able to go to the college I went to if I hadn't made all that money. Yeah. And then give absolutely all of it to the <laughs> New York University Real Estate Corporation, as it has become. <laughs> <laughs> Just buying up every building below Thirty Fourth Street, basically. Yeah. I so I did have a question based on on some weird things that you did because you mm. got to live every child's dream in being in an action figure commercial. Yes. Is it as fun as you imagine it to be? Because it's still a commercial job. Yes and no, okay. I would say. It's incredible because you go on and, I mean, 
the room is just filled with toys, oh. like triples and quadruples of everything. And there are a team of artists whose job it is to like modify and augment and repair and paint and replace all of these toys. Oh, um, childhood uh, ruination number one. Yes. Every single toy in those commercials is modded, um, oh. rebalanced, stronger springs, lighter or heavier as it needs to be. Um, Got it. Okay. So that it, it looks and performs better in the commercial. Um, sure. They, but yeah, like the real practical set is all built to scale and stuff and like very, very, very cool. Very fun. Very exciting. Um, <laughs> I'll tell the story despite. <laughs> this is, this, Let's go. This, Buckle up. This, my yeah the, <laughs> i was maybe five or six when i did that commercial um mm. i think I, I was pretty young um and it was the 90s and i yeah. don't believe i, I th if i was five or six i was not in sag yet so it was a non-union commercial and not Perfect. to disparage this production of whom i have no idea what it was but you know it was a it was a little bit of a you know run and gun kind of 90s commercial set from what my vague memory of it and there was a little key light um set up for one of like the insert shots of me like holding up the iron man figure uh -huh. and at one point it was just like okay like where we said like just everybody left me alone i was just sort of just like <laughs> sitting there like minding my own business and i looked at this little key light and like a dipshit kid i was like oh i wonder what that feels like and i reached out <laughs> and i touched it and it was a fucking tungsten filament oh, light no. burning at probably like 600 degrees just <laughs> right instant raised blister on oh, my finger and no. i obviously was just like howling and screaming and my mom was like oh take it back and i, I remember very distinctly <laughs> oh my mom running my my finger under the under the faucet being like if you keep crying you won't get to do the rest of the commercial and they're going to call <laughs> another little boy in to do the commercial. You don't want no. that to happen, do you? I was like, no, I don't. And I soldiered <laughs> through, which is like, that's so nice. And then also like, Jesus Christ, that's not, that's not normal. <laughs> that's not a normal day. Um, but I did go back and finish the spot, um, which was really fun. You know, I, I got to flip the little beast figure yeah. and like move the little thing to make the Sentinel's foot fall off. And, um, I think my, my moment of my redemptive moment of triumph after burning my fucking finger off was um <laughs> you had to like push the little spring down and release it so that the beast would flip. And they were like, listen, we're going to do this for like a half an hour. Like we're just sure. going to get as many takes of this as we need. And then one of them will work. So just get ready. Or do you need a juice or anything mm -hmm. like it's like, okay. I shit you not first take. I flipped it and it landed on its feet. And it wobbled like it was walking and it wobbled off screen. What? And I remember everybody on set literally going, Whoa! Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, fuck. And they're like, check the gate, check the gate. They like rewound the film to watch yeah, it. There's right. no monitors or anything. They watched like, oh my God, we're good. Great job. And everybody all, all the like grips were like patting me on the back. I had no <laughs> idea why, but I was like, oh. The adults like me. I will. I will chase right. this validation for the rest of my natural life. Right. <laughs> this isn't a poison pill or anything. <laughs> there's right. no. There's no downside to this experience. No, um, you're a consummate professional from the gate. You got absolutely, this. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Sitting there in the Pocahontas Tiger video game commercial, smoke's blowing Boom. in my face. Just take it. Just take it on. Just the chin. take it. Just take it. No. This big is what deal. a professional looks like. <laughs> God, I remember like doing like holding in an abandoned Kmart on like yeah. Eighth <laughs> Avenue, just like literally like garbage and like obviously like unhoused domicile sort of material mattresses and stuff like in the corner just mm -hmm. sitting there in a circle of folding chairs like are they ever going to call us to set is this forever <laughs> like Am a I lot safe? of <laughs> yeah a lot of very weird like 90s ah kids are fine put them in a duffel bag kind of kind of sure. situations or put them in sure. a wedding or put them in a wedding jesus christ boom. you did do your homework look at that craig good god i got you comfortable and then boom this guy this fucking guy, he digs through your Instagram. Oh, dude, not just your finds Instagram. things. Oh, Jesus, data mining. So the last four of your social security number, it's got yeah, a nice yeah. kind of ring to it, doesn't it? It does, it does. One of my first professional jobs was being hired to be in a wedding. Um, yeah. 
this is back this back in the day way um, back when way back when printed black and white headshots in a three ring binder in somebody's office that is classic. how you would have to go look yeah you know class it literally classic <laughs> and my manager had obviously my headshot in this binder that just you know but you know Mitt Romney had his binders full of women you know of course my manager had binders full of children same thing not creepy at all <laughs> um and this very lovely Greek couple, I believe they were both doctors, had like Amazing. moved here. They had like jobs at a nice hospital and they were getting married and they wanted to have a quintessential American wedding. So part of their idea of having a quintessential American wedding was, well, we need to get the whitest, liliest looking <laughs> motherfucking kids to be our ring bearer and our flower girl. So they picked this toe headed, curly little blonde chick <laughs> and me. Just the most Caucasian thing that's ever existed right. <laughs> to be in their wedding. And my manager's like, hey, they want your kid to be in their wedding. And my mom very normally was like, well, sure. How much does it pay? <laughs> and it was con mama. it was contingent on they have to rent me a tux and they have to let me take photos in it Amazing. so that my mom could have pictures of me in a tuxedo. So they rented me. I was five years old. They rented me a tuxedo. <laughs> we drove to, you know cherry hill or wherever in jersey they were and i was just in this couple's wedding which was a greek orthodox wedding which in my <laughs> mind took 11 and a half hours oh, no. i and like we we weren't just for the we were in the wedding i was sitting in the front pew i had to get up and walk in a circle like with an incense ball being swung around oh, like really? we were we were fully in you were the legit ceremony in a real wedding we were in the wedding and then did two hours of photos like glitzy not, she had the white train and he had the matching tuxedo and we were so i am on <laughs> so, hopefully still some calpacus or tufexis family mantle yeah. somewhere in like central new jersey just like who is that kid and i hope that they just go uh we had just moved here and it was the 90s and we hired children to be right. our wedding. it's <laughs> it's no big deal we found him yeah, that's what it was. And, and again, you know, you you think that's normal until you meet literally one other person <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> ever, and they and the look. I got very familiar with that look of just like, what? Yeah. What? Why? What are you talking about? <laughs> just like, oh, I need to, I need to, I need to not tell this story anymore. <laughs> like, I people live are going to be that freaked look. out. Yeah, it's it's a good look, and it's a look I've gotten very familiar with. Yeah, that's when For you know sure. you got a good story. You know, yeah, that's what it's I mean, all about, and that is what it's all about. Yeah, you. I mean, you know, you get to be, you get to be our age, and you've kind, you've got the hits, you've got the yeah. chestnuts oh, yeah. that you dust off, and that's. I'm not gonna say that I'm upset that it happened because it's a great right? story, it's and then I show story. them it's a great picture, picture of my my dorky little ass, yeah, <laughs> that tuxedo. Like, why? Oh, were you in like your uncle's wedding? Like, close, hired <laughs> to be in a Greek physician's right? wedding for six hundred, Alex. Like, <laughs> it's a, li it's got a little bit of a different flavor to it. I would say much better story. Much better story. It is. It is a better story, which is what it's all about. So I know you're doing all these commercials. Then you go to New York and you're yeah. working in New York. And then you studied Stella Adler. <clears throat> I did. Yeah. I which went is to my favorite. Oh, amazing. Great. Yeah. So it... I want to talk about that because all Let's of start... my stuff is just like reading books. And like I've read, heard this one here. Art, Art of Acting, the one that's transcribed uh, by Howard Cassell. The Technique of Acting. The Technique of Acting. Fantastic. Oh. That's, an, that's a good one too. Yeah. Big fan. Big fan. Amazing. Yeah. I'm halfway um, through a Meisner book right now. And it's very oh. different. It's like, okay. Just, yeah. Uh, but Very I like different. Adler. So for someone who's actually studied, how did you find it? And like um was it I, good for you? It was it was really good for me. I went yeah. to Stella through um I went to NYU, uh their arts it's called the Tisch School of the Arts, which is art and film and drama and music and composition and dramatic writing and acting and everything else. So you go to Tisch, that's the college at the university, I guess, however you 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 uh demarcate it. Mm -hmm. And at the time I think still, although a lot of the studios are different, it was a studio system. So like, you know, you go to, if you go to a certain college for acting, it's like, well, everybody is in the acting program. And at NYU, because it's so big, um, you don't necessarily go to the same classes as like 80 to 90% of the people that go to school with you because you are in your own studio. Um, oh, and at, okay. at the time, a lot of these are no longer there, but at the time I think it was like Adler, Strasberg, Meisner, mm -hmm. ETW, which is the Experimental Theater Wing, um, okay. Cap 21, which at the time was the musical theater, 
department. Oh. And then there were some other sub studios um, that were not full four years. They were the, the last two years. You can go to classical studio mm -hmm. um, or you can go to Stone Street, which is like their t television and film studio. Okay. And the, the idea was as part of your application process, you would do research on these studios as a high school student and kind of pick where you thought you wanted to go. Oh, and interesting. That, and that was part of the process. So like the NYU audition um, would be to go and do a couple contrasting monologues and get interviewed a little bit. You submit, you, you have to get into NYU as well. So you got to submit all that other shit. Right. Um, and then part of the conversation was like, well, what are your top two studios and why? Yeah. And you say, well, I, I feel like based on the research I've done, I feel like I'd enjoy this or this. And they either pick those or they don't based oh. on what they think <laughs> you would. It's not like, oh, well, if you get in, it'll be one of those two. It's like, ah, we'll take that into consideration. But right. I had many friends that were like, I want to go to Strasbourg to be a dramatic actor. And they're like, great, you are in the musical theater studio. Or <laughs> oh, no. I want to be on Broadway and be a chorus. was like, great, you're in Meisner. No musical training there at all, Ooh. which is insane, right. obviously. <laughs> it's like, hey, pay us at the time, you know, 36 thousand dollars a year yeah. whatever the whatever the fuck it was to like not quite do what you wanted to do but hey that's what it's NYU like the military like. i like exactly. these bases cool this one can you empty. can you can you imagine <laughs> that if it's like hi i want to join the army great you're on a submarine congratulations yeah, right? yeah it's like <laughs> uh, uh wait what that's the opposite that's not even the same thing right. <laughs> i got lucky i did my research and, and adler was my number one um cool I think I read either that book or one of the other books um, that like one of my acting teachers um, sussed up for me or I found at Barnes and Noble or something. And it seemed like um, like Adler, Adler is like the AP English studio. Like, sure. If you're a real word book text mm -hmm. nerd, I feel like that's the place for you to be because the work is so text based and it's right. so heady. I, I like to say heady. It, it, it's, it's got big heart too. It's obviously it's not just analytical, but like, right. I, I like Adler because the way in is the text and sure. the way in is journaling and homework and research and collating and mm -hmm. information. You know, that I think that was what I responded to. And I think they were definitely like, well, your math score was awful and your English <laughs> scores were great. So this is probably going to work out well for you. And Christ knows you don't like what you, you can dance. So let's keep you, <laughs> let's keep your gangly ass out of cap 21. <laughs> and I was lucky enough to get placed where I wanted to go, which was, it was the right, it was, the, it was the place that I belonged. I think at NYU. Yeah. Like I had, I had a really, really good experience. Um, I, 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 as I've gotten older, I try to even, I try, I try to check my privilege as much as possible. Like I, I want to say this, like with the understanding that like, I was a white cisgendered guy totally. who was yep. six foot three inches tall. Mm -hmm. And obviously I had an easier time. Like I had an <laughs> yeah. easier time because of that. Like totally. as a, as a male, you're a, uh, you're a minority in, in just the quantitative sense. There are just less guys than girls right. in an arts program. So mm -hmm. less quote unquote competition, you know, mm -hmm. um, a little bit it, 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 it was definitely like it was definitely a path of privilege um sure but i i had i had a really positive experience i really really enjoyed it um ather was immediately out of the gate lots of voice and speech which i really mm -hmm. enjoyed um coming from like a lot of singing and a lot of music and stuff as a kid a lot of movement that was the big surprise of what i enjoyed about adler i think oh, okay i really enjoyed ballet and we did viewpoints and uh, joanne edelman and um, Joni Evans were two of the movement instructors when I was there. We did just weird, crazy, modern, avant-garde nonsense, which as like a country kid in yeah. New York City, like, well, gee, well, you look at these tall buildings. Everything's up to date in Kansas City. Like, right. <laughs> you'd think I'd be like, what the hell is this? I I really, really enjoyed all that weird stuff. Yeah. I found that to be really fun. And that's when I started studying Shakespeare for the first time, too, which I took to, um, I took to really strongly. Utah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I did a, I did a, uh, like an art scholarship program in high school that like I only did cause my mom saw on like the course from bulletin board called the NFAA, which I think the national foundation for advancement in the arts it was like, a monologue. You. there you go. Yeah. Again, that's Canon. Um, <laughs> it was like a monologue competition, um, that you'd send in a VHS tape, um, beautiful, to, uh, to compete with this and i got i got selected to go to florida to your to your Ayo, my we stomping to, grounds i believe i want to say the university of miami hosted it i want to say okay, we we're in my we we're in my we we're in miami um and flew down 
took some master classes. Anthony Rapp was there oh, and dude. taught us some acting classes, which was really cool. fun. I was I was a every other musical theater kid of my generation. A huge rent was like oh yeah it the musical yeah. it was the thing um so that was ridiculous um because of that uh the utah shakespeare festival which is a large uh regional theater in cedar city utah at the time had a program where you could be like an nfaa intern if you had oh, done yeah. nfaa they had a program where it's like oh you could apply to be quote unquote an intern which i was like oh i'll, I'll run coffee and like print out scripts all summer but sure i I looked into it, it was like you're you're just a member of the non-equity company like there's oh. just two interns a year sure so I I kind of just kind of like back ended my way <laughs> into there this you go. into this regional theater company and found out in like April of my freshman year that like hey like a week before finals you have to be in Cedar City Utah for a fitting so I had Sheesh. to like get out of class and like write papers early and fly from New York to Utah until the week after classes started. It was a 17 week contract. Ooh, so it was like, it. Oh, I guess I don't need a summer job. Cause I just got a summer job. And like, yeah. I guess I'm not going to go visit my friends because I'm going to be <laughs> in the middle of what I thought was the middle of nowhere for yeah. the entire summer. And yeah, like I, I packed up my bags. I think NFAA was the first time I ever flew by myself. Nice. And then Utah was like the second time. It was like, put stuff in a suitcase, showed up at an airport. I mean, this is no internet, no smartphones, barely sure. any social media, just showing up to be picked up by a stray. I was, I was, I just turned, <laughs> I turned 18 a couple months before. I just like showed up like, okay, I guess I live here now with these we people. Go. And I guess I have rehearsal tomorrow. I have to check the envelope that I was sent because <laughs> yeah. there's no way to like text anybody or anything. And yeah, I, j I lived in Utah and did, we did Camelot and Dr. Faustus for my cool. first two shows in 2005. Wow. That's pretty heavy. Was, yeah. It was, it was <laughs> Out the fun. gate doing Faustus. Well done. Out the gate doing Faustus. I mean, I had trust. I had nothing to do in these <laughs> right. plays. When I say I had no lines in Dr. Faustus, I mean, quite literally I had, zero lines <laughs> your um, body was present <laughs> my body was present my body was present in a green body suit oh because i played the fifth devil was my oh character. boom <laughs> we were in neck to toe lycra green spotted body suits amazing white devilish face paint and like sort of chris angel mind freak like yeah emo bang wigs with um, yes. <laughs> with horns the real acting <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and 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 we each like created our own little physicality i kind of made him like a velociraptor devil and i just yeah sort of, like, did a lot of like this kind of thing and I it was it. our job to just like do set changes and kind of like creepily like yeah. wander around the audience and stare at people and that I was mostly it. what i did for 17 weeks <laughs> and it was incredible because i mean it, regional theater a good regional theater is just summer camp yeah, totally. Everybody's away from home. And like, I mean, I met incredible, amazing, literally lifelong friends, like the person who became one of my absolute best friends in the world, Eric Van Tielen, who is an amazing um, actor on Broadway and in regional theater all over the East Coast and stuff. I met him in 2005. He later, he officiated my wedding. I mean, this cool. like people, people that like I've made lifelong friendships with just because you're hanging out. There's nothing to do. Yeah. There's, two restaurants there's no bars because it's utah yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> and you just like hang out and play poker and do your shows and do little cabarets and i'd, I'd like anybody wanted to sing i always played guitar for them so just cool. like got to be in like a bunch of bands all summer and go hiking because southwestern utah is just like the most impossibly beautiful yeah. part of the country um Bryce is right there and Cedar Breaks is right there and Zion is right there. It was it was incredible. I did that for three I did that all through college. Every summer oh, cool. in between years of college, I would just go from May to September. I lived in Utah. It was really, really great. Wow. So you're getting yeah. like the full double helping. You got your actual studio training and then training in yeah. a theater doing it Shakespeare. Was, it, it, was, it was the best. And yeah, then the, the next two seasons I did actually get to do some Shakespeare too. We did um we did Merry Wives and Antony and Cleopatra and HMS Pinafore, my cool. second season there. So I got to still do musicals. So much go. fun. Um, and then I did King Lear 
and Coriolanus and the matchmaker, I think, was my last cool. season there. Um, I got to be the fight captain for Coriolanus, which was the youngest incredible. in history I've heard. I was. I, I, I mean, you know, and again, this is canon. Who did you, who um, did you kill for this? Uh, I think, yeah, who, who did I have to kill? The previous <laughs> Robin, one, that's it. Robin McMarker and Dave <laughs> yeah. Brimmer. Um, yeah. all, these, all these fight masters. Anyone that stepped up, that's Anybody it. that stood in my way, I stabbed them with a blunted rapier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Takes skill. Of, it does. It does take skill. One of the things I did at NYU, um, I, I took I took every stage combat class I could. Um, J. David Brimmer, I believe still is, but was the fight master at NYU. Absolute legendary Broadway yeah. fight and violence and blood choreographer. Um, cool. Are you a McDonough fan at all, Martin McDonough? In Bruges, Seven Psychopaths. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah, are like absolutely. his movies. He he was a playwright for many years before he started doing films as well. So Lieutenant of Inishmore, Cripple of Inishmon, a lot of other sort of like uh, Behanding in Spokane. This is some of his plays. The, the, the Pillow Man was his other big one. Yes. That made a big splash. Billy Crudup, Jeff Goldblum, Jelko Ivanek, and Michael Stuhlbarg, cool. I think, were the original cast. I saw that OB, OBC. Did you? Holy fuck. That's a whole other story. Dude. But um, for Lieutenant of Inishmore, um, the play opens with a guy hanging upside down by his ankles about to get like gangland <laughs> assassinated. There are multiple gunfights on stage. A cat gets shot with a shotgun on stage. And cool. Brimmer was the person who figured out how to do all those things. So like eight shows a week squibs exploding blood effects like Dude. that was brimmer and he's and he's you know a master of all armed combat and for two credits you could just take an entire semester's class with him and oh, it was dude, so, get in some it. of the best yeah the best some of the best acting training i got at nyu just in terms of like connecting to breath and connecting to truth and being in your body and stuff um yeah but i liked it so much that i became his ta um cool. so even when i wasn't taking classes i would show up unlock the weapons cabinet, pass out all the swords, help, you know, adjust people's form and help sure. run the class with them and stuff. Um, so I was kind of teed up by my third year at Utah Shakespeare. Like, yeah, I, I, I can, I can do this. Like sure. I do this all year anyway. What that, what that ends up meaning is again, just like you can, you're like, Oh, here's an extra hundred dollars for 17 <laughs> weeks. Here's a <laughs> monumental amount of work. Sure. His Coriolanus, the first act and a half is all fighting. Right. It's just like Romans and Volscians fighting the entire yep. like first 20 pages of this fucking play. So, you know, 10 or 11 person ensemble, you are a Roman and then you get killed and fall off stage and then you change your helmet and your armor and then you're a Volscian upstairs and then you're this and you're that. There you go. And as the fight captain, you have to keep all that. You have to write down every piece of choreography in mm -hmm. an understandable notation to be submitted to the stage manager. You have sure. to run everybody's understudy rehearsals because the people that are understudying the leads, they have to learn all their lines and then they also have to learn their big oh, fights. Oh, right. And you have to be ready to either sub or step in in case somebody goes out. Whew. So at points in the season, you know, somebody would be sick or somebody would miss a show or whatever. And like we realized way too late that um, <laughs> I call it like the uh, the understudy circle. Yeah. There are 11 of us, and like I'm understudying you, and you're understudying Walt, and Walt's understudying Sarah, and Sarah's understudying Melanie, and Melanie's understudying me. Uh oh, that <laughs> that doesn't work if you do no. it in a circle, because if one person goes out, you there's not enough people to slot in. So right. it, it was like being a quarterback because we would huddle, we would literally huddle up off stage in between scenes, going, Who's in this next fight? Well, yeah. I'm understudying Michael, but Michael's out. Great. Can you say his lines? Yes, I can. But if I do that, then I'm not upstairs and I can't get killed by Eric. Cool. I will run upstairs and get killed by Eric. Well, I'm supposed to fight you down here. I will just have to run very fast in that case. <laughs> and I am literally just like doffing helmets, switching weapons, like Goodness. To, to make the show go through. Every once in a while, you know, somebody will attack you and a spear will explode. And sure. everybody will kind of look at each other like, in the next five minutes as you're fighting, pick up a chunk and put it in your pocket. Pick right. up a chunk and throw it off stage. <laughs> like try to clear the area here. Um, that's basically, you know, outdoor theater. outdoor thrust theater. Yeah. Just trying to make it work. <laughs> um, which is amazing. It was, I mean, it was it was the best. It was, it was really, really, it was really incredible. It was amazing. At that point, you'd done a lot of like on camera stuff, but you also had done a lot of theater. Did you have a preference? 
I hadn't done a lot of narrative on camera stuff. I mm. never really was able to break in um, narratively as a kid for whatever sure. reason. I did tons of commercials and I did lots of voiceover. I did a little bit of animation. I had mm -hmm. done like a couple of soap operas. That was it. But okay. I was never sort of like the kid on Law and Order, or like the kid, right. on, you know, whatever other shows were on then. Um, so I think at the time I, I, I really did think I wanted to do theater forever, yeah. especially after going to Utah, meeting all these journeymen sure theater actors and just being like man this is so cool this rule yeah like i absolutely love this and that's what i did for a while after school being in new york i mean boom yeah that's the yeah, place I mean, for it exactly like you know getting the getting up at 2 30 in the morning to mm -hmm. go stand in line in the rain outside of the equity building mm -hmm. you're not allowed to use the bathroom because you're not an actor's equity member so you have to go to the <laughs> mcdonald's on 49th and 10th and fight with everybody else <laughs> hoping to audition Hoping right. that enough equity members don't show up that the equity candidates can get through. And then maybe you can do your monologue at 4 p.m. Or what would happen most of the time would be you'd wait there all day. And eventually the the mo the monitor of the other should go, slots are full. Sorry, guys. Try again Ooh. next time. You really got to want it to be in that slog. Every single week. Yeah. And that became a real <laughs> pain in the ass. And it was not very fun. Um Sure. I was able to do a lot of like off, off, off and downtown stuff. Like I had met people at Utah that lived in New York. So, um, you know, my, my friend David Ian Lee, who I did Utah with in 2006, um, really amazing actor, director, playwright. He teaches down in Tennessee now. Um, you know, he wrote a play. I was like, oh, you should be in this play. So I would do that play at Manhattan Theater Source in a little box for no money. And then, oh, sure. well, now Nat, who directed this, he wrote a play. And then his his friend's girlfriend is in the show. Though you should slot in to do this. So I kind of I got I got a really nice little community of like um, community of sort of independent theater makers. Cool. Um, and yeah, it was just like you know living with my living with my buddies in a big haunted house in Long Island. Um, there you go, as uh, you my, do. Like you do, my friend's grandparents had passed away in the 90s and their house was still just sort of standing there. Um, sure. And eventually, once once we got kicked out of our apartment, like eight guys in five bedrooms with one bathroom, <laughs> that was a whole, that, there's a whole podcast about that. Um, he was like, hey, why don't you and me and you and another friend of ours, we should just like live in my grandparents' house. So I was living on the third floor in the attic of this gigantic house Riding the lure, going to auditions, driving a food truck. Get it? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that was New York for a while. Um, and then my my then girlfriend, now wife, um, who I met in David's stage combat class. Uh, oh, she what? Took, she took rapier and dagger. And I was like, this woman is amazing. I really <laughs> right? like, I like everything. I like the way she handles her, her, her handles herself in a fight. Um, That's right. You know, it's that, you know, you say like, you know, love at first sight. And that was, that was basically it. I said, yeah. man, I gotta, I gotta ask you out. She's like, I was wondering when you were going to, it's been 10 weeks of you like <laughs> puppy dog wandering around me like an idiot. And, you know, right. after, after the first, you know, the first date, first date, never look back. Um, yeah. You just knew. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I just, I, feel I, you. I disappeared for days. My roommates at that ship were like, oh, I thought you were like, we just haven't seen you since like last Thursday. I was like, I, <laughs> Her her place is so nice. This, <laughs> this apartment's so gross. We're all disgusting. Her sheets are clean and it doesn't smell like hot dogs. And I like it a lot. She has apartment. sheets, guys. She, yeah, yeah. Literally, she has sheets. Yeah, she's not living in a room where your roommate is so close <laughs> that you could slap him in the face from your bed when his alarm goes off for the tenth right. time because your just two twin beds are in a little closet. Um, she yes. really wanted to move out here, which was okay. Like, completely outside the bounds of possible of my thinking because I I, I'm, a, I'm a plotter i'm like i will do this thing until i die like yeah, i'm just I i'm not you. a i'm not a big look up kind of guy and she's sure. very she's very good at like seeing the whole picture she's like i think we should move to la like let's get out of here we bought her high school car from her parents in minnesota drove it out here in 2009 hell um, yeah. yeah so been here for 13 years wow was it different I, than you I, expected I, I would spent a little bit of time here every once in a while. My mom would fly me out because um, my manager eventually moved from New York to here when I was still acting as a kid. So mm -hmm. I'd come out and like have agency meetings and like do tests and read for people. Nothing ever really okay. came of it. So I'd spent a little bit of time here. Um, that helps. I knew a fair amount of people here, which was nice. 
sure. um, from Utah Shakes and from doing theater and just from people, you know, people end up moving here. Um, right. And we sort of became, we weren't the first of like the New York, especially New York University, like expat community. But sure. we were pretty early. So we got to hang out with a couple of our friends that were either from here or moved here before us. And then like, especially that first five, six years, it was just like, oh, these people are here now. Oh, and this person's here now. Oh, and you moved here too. Oh, and this. And got that and the other thing. Like, and we, to this day, st- there's, I mean, a huge NYU Tish community. No great surprise. A lot of actors sure. are moving to Los Angeles. It's not, you know, it's not rocket surgery. As right. Yeah. <laughs> We were able to, we were able to, able to build able to build a really nice um community here pretty quickly and made a lot of new friends too which was nice cool. and especially early on in those days like I describe like L A is a lot easier to be poor than New York yeah is slash was. makes sense um the apartments are bigger and at the time were a little bit cheaper um it was just incredible to not have to deal with the cold yeah winter, I mean it's a cliche but winter in New York is tough when you're like yeah slogging your way to your shitty job yeah on the subway <laughs> and your shoes are wet and ev- you're freezing your ass off and then for me your job was sitting in a metal box parked on saint mark's place handing people bread pudding right pulling up next to the space heater and then <laughs> driving the truck back to the commissary like it's like i don't i don't want to be cold anymore i feel you there yeah cold sucks cold sucks yeah and yeah. just being able to be outside all the time it, it was it was sure. really fun um my wife and I both grew up driving, so like getting used to the car culture was not weird. I know I had a sure. lot of friends who maybe like were from the city or like oh from yeah different cities were like holy shit like I have to buy a car and like <laughs> gotta drive everywhere like eh, you kind of have to drive everywhere. Yeah, that was relatively easy to get used to, but yeah, came out here and just sort of like tried to hit the ground running. Did a lot of UCB, cool, took a lot of improv classes and stuff, which was very fun. I got a commercial agent relatively quickly and was able to do some pretty fun commercials. I did a Super Bowl spot. That was probably like uh-huh. a I've commercial seen it. highlight. It was it's it was pretty great. Very awesome. Yeah. A very weird day. I'm just like, hey, this is Ridley Scott's son Jake. He's directing yeah. <laughs> this hundred and fifty person Budweiser commercial because money doesn't mean anything. And we'll right. <laughs> Yeah, we got to do New York Street. It was like a prohibition commercial. So I was uh-huh. like a, new, a newspaper boy. <laughs> the best um, role of the commercial, to be honest. I I def I had the lion's share of stuff to do for you sure. You did, you did. That ad was so funny because initially I think we all just read for sort of like sad dirt on face dust bowl people because the, sure. the first audition was just like just sort of stare literally a lineup of guys just sort of stare into the middle distance and like contemplate the enormity of the responsibility of buying bread for your family. I'm like. Right. <laughs> okay fine it's i will like, stare man. into the middle distance <laughs> hey c- congrats you got called back for that commercial okay and i was in there and jake was at the callback and he was sort of going down the line and he, he came up to me sort of like you look like a runner are you a runner <laughs> it's like i've never run a day in my life i fucking hate running so With of course feet, what i said of course well, of course what i said was absolutely i love to run running is my favorite thing yeah. i will do whatever you say <laughs> again i will chase your validation to my own yes. uh, to my own harm until i die yes and literally it was for some reason it wasn't even in like a traditional like it wasn't at like 200 south it wasn't at uh, ocean park it wasn't one of these traditional casting studios it was like in an office it's like can i see you run a little bit would you mind like going down the hallway and just sort of like bursting in here. I was like, I will do whatever you ask me to. Right. I am 23 years old and desperate. Yeah. And I was like, okay, fuck this. I like went into somebody's office at the end of the hallway. I was like, excuse me, sorry, I need a head start here. Right. And I just tore through this poor fucking bunch of people working. Yeah. Literally, <laughs> papers are flying off desks. I'm like bumping into cubicle walls. People are like, what the fuck? People were like screaming <laughs> right. after me and I burst into the room. Yes, that's really good. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. It's like, okay, thank you. And that's all I did in the commercial was run. Amazing. I just ran <laughs> and I chased after him and the DP on the back of a golf cart up New York street at Universal Studios on the back lot, screaming my head off in like leather dress shoes that had no soles <laughs> on concrete that they had wet so that it looked better on camera. So like, there's a very high chance of me like tripping yeah. and fracturing my skull here, but <laughs> fuck it, leave it all on the table. Yeah. And that was it was just it, it was just that for a day. I just did wind sprints for a wow. day. That was like my part in the commercial was just 
keep up with the camera, keep up with the camera, run, 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 run. Um, wow. Yeah. It's another just like very weird yeah. sort of like, oh, yeah, that was work today. It's, it's I like a, it. it. It's a magical thing. All the weird bullshit you get to do. So much of this is just like it's mostly not working. Right. Totally. It's mostly trying. Nobody to tells you that not. part. No, it's and and it's it's impossible to convey. You can't tell a twenty year old. Yeah, the, the the things that it'd be nice if they knew about Agreed. the industry. I feel like um, for a couple of reasons, like they're not ready to hear it. They don't mm -hmm. have the context to understand it necessarily. And like, yeah, I go back and forth about wishing I knew more, and then having the feeling like, do I have a responsibility to like try to tell? younger actors right. some of this stuff i go back and forth between that and just being like i don't i don't know if i don't know if there is a way to convey yeah. those things it's something you have to just sort of learn yeah i think so too yeah i mean even on the job there's so much waiting you know it's like 10 hours of sitting around to five minutes of shooting then they literally gotta switch it, everything around you're like we're back again <laughs> all and only hurry up and wait yeah like, yeah and yeah that sort of like icing out the picture Mm -hmm. Close. You, I mean, you got to be Mariana Rivera. You got to yeah. be okay with like <laughs> five hours of sitting around, mm -hmm. and then you got to get up and close. Yeah, and that like it, it's a thing that's not conveyed, especially because because theater's not like that. You know, right? You'll have one day of tech rehearsal that feels like that when they're doing light cues or you're doing a zits probe or something. You're like, man, we're just sitting around here all day once. <laughs> right. But every other time, it's like we're doing exercises and running scenes and doing the play. It's like. You don't get used to that until you realize like the pace of TV right. and film. Um and it's a hard it's a hard thing to get used to. Um totally. Uh once you do, it's nice. I would say like handheld video games are a real boon. Yeah. Like, I'm on set now. I'm like, yeah, call me whenever. I I call me whenever. <laughs> I go I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> whatever I'm, you I'm, need. I'm playing Hades. I have my headphones in. I'm gonna go to Crafty and put peanut butter on another banana. You, yeah. you know what? Don't call me today. <laughs> call me back tomorrow. I'll take yeah. another session, Pete. That's totally fine. I'll take another day. Whatever. Whatever you need, just tag but me it, in. It takes a long time to not just be sitting in your trailer, like keyed up to shit. Oh yeah. Worried and nervous and waiting. It's it takes a lot of experience. Just be like, oh, this is what this is, and I'm just gonna be cool. And then yeah. they'll call me to set and it'll be fine. And it's no big deal. Isn't that wild to be able to get there? Because when you can't fathom that, when you're first getting there, you're like, okay, right, we're going, it's time. And then you're yeah. eight hours sitting in that. But then you're like, oh, we'll get there. I feel like auditioning is like that too. Yeah, um, it definitely. It really is like, I, di I don't think I started to book commercials until I, until I stopped giving a shit if I ever booked a commercial. Yeah, it makes sense. Because you're, if you want it too badly, that smells. energy, exactly. They yeah. smell it on you a mile away, and it doesn't mm -hmm. smell like excitement. It smells like desperation. Yeah, nobody wants that. Nobody. It's not. It's not a good energy. It's not a good energy to bring into mm -hmm. a job interview, which is what it is. A good energy to bring into a job interview is, "Hey, what's up? It's nice to see you. Uh, you know, stand over here. Yeah, okay. Do your thing. Thanks so much. Bye. Have a great day. Yep. Here's Walk my thing. Out. If you yep. want it, here it is. If yep. not, see you later. Pre-pandemic, um, I think I had gotten to a point like that with TV as well. Because um, cool. I, I got there with commercials, like eh, commercial auditions are what they are. Right. I'm just going to go in and do my thing. But TV auditions were still kind of like a monolith. I still got really a little bit more nervous, a little bit more like I wanted yeah. it a little bit too much. I think I had just started to get over that when the pandemic hit in terms of like being in person. And, you know, I, I started to feel when I booked it in the room and it wasn't because oh. of anything else than coming in with that energy, you know, yeah. just knowing like. Oh, because I came in. Hey, you have any questions? No, I I appreciate you bringing me in. I'm just going to show you what I got. Do the thing. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. Um, good luck with the casting and walk out. That is such like a. Oh yeah, because oh, they're like, what does he okay. know that we don't? It, exactly. It just makes you. It just makes you a little bit more confident. And from their perspective, it's like that's a person that they can send to set. Right. You know, because that's yeah. their job is to send people to their coworkers and hopefully not have them be a total fucking basket case. <laughs> yeah. And to be able to do the job. And if you come into the room and are just like, this is what I do. And here it is. And I appreciate the opportunity to show it. But I understand that you have a bunch of other people to see. So I'm going to get out of your way. Mm -hmm. That's just like, okay, cool. I can probably send him to this big hundreds of thousands of dollars per day costing yeah. machine. And he won't pour sugar in the tank, you know? Sure. And then, of course, pandemic hits. And now it's all self-tapes and good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no more booking it in the room yeah right. no more no more energy in the room no more shooting the shit yeah 
it took a lot it took a lot of it away for a lot of people i think i think a lot of people yeah. um really enjoy booking from tape i think a lot of people really enjoy this guy the custom great multiple you, takes <laughs> exactly multiple yeah. takes you get to take some risks you get to show an alt you get to send a b take if you mm. want to and, there, and i enjoy those things too those are nice but like for me i think maybe because i am i am an extrovert i am a people person sure um, i really like i really like connecting with people i r l and yeah. because of my theater background too i think totally i i feel like i i've lost um i've lost a little bit of one of the things that i had an audience yeah you lose your audience and you lose the ability to really just like create yeah um, to create an energy to create a feeling in the room one of the last things i booked in person before the pandemic i was playing a cop on mixed dish nice. Yes. No great surprise. Uh, I go in for a lot of racist cops <laughs> because, <laughs> first of all, there are a lot of racist cops. Oh, God, yep. um, but also, just you know, if you're, you know, if you look like me, you uh -huh. play a lot of boorish, douchey assholes, yeah. which is <laughs> yeah. great. I will ride that horse in the direction it's going a bunch forever. Of them. I cast is still it's, cast, baby. Hey, listen, that's that's all that matters. Um, yeah. So it's a part. It's a part I'm familiar with, and I was supposed to pull somebody over and be fucking noxious and intimidating and a jerk. Sure. And I know that on the day in the room, I came in and made everybody in the room uncomfortable in a good yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. And I, I knew that I booked it as soon as I did it. I was literally just like, I finished the scene. I, thanks so much. I appreciate it. And I purposely just, I didn't even want to talk to them afterward because I didn't want to have, hey, yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah, I've actually auditioned for you before. I didn't want to reveal that I am a dorky attention right. teddy bear. Show them the character. Exactly. Because I knew that the impression I had left was like, this fucking guy is a dick yeah and that's what they needed so i just right. it's like i think that's a really important skill to learn too just like leave them laughing or leave them wanting more get the yeah. fuck out of there mm -hmm. before you can dirty up whatever energy you just created yeah if you made him laugh thanks so much this was so much fun bounce don't yeah. risk your next joke falling flat if you made him feel uncomfortable reveal that you're not a weirdo thanks i really appreciate it this was really fun and then just leave just right fucking run to your car right and get out of your way gonna, yeah <laughs> exactly get out of your way and you'll probably have a voicemail like, oh they really liked you yeah and that took a while to learn for sure I, I try to bring that into into my voiceover work as much as i can too just like take yeah. a risk take a risk take your time take your space but also just like present the thing that you think it is and then just get out of there without apology yeah. you know don't quantify don't qualify just work really hard and present something to them and then leave it and move on to the next thing. Yeah. I find that's the way to go. And you, there's so is. many things outside of your like control. Cause it's like, you do your thing. It's like, yeah, you might be too tall. You might be too short. Like that has nothing to do with your performance, but no, it, there's so many things that's not quite what they wanted. It's like, well then they just didn't want your thing. If exactly. your thing is what they're looking for, yeah. it's yours. Bob Bergen, um, the amazing legend, absolutely ridiculous also previous legendary. guest. I was going to say, hey, Bob Bergen. I don't know if he. I don't know if he analogized this on your show. I will um, not steal it from him. But just Let's do present. it. I mean, this is this is steal from the best. Tell right, you I, I, yeah, exactly. Good artist borrow, great artist steal. Uh -huh. um, one of my favorite of his many amazing bits of wisdom for um, actors is the way that he thinks about auditioning and him submitting or recording an audition. Is he says, you know, I'm having a party. My audition is the party, and you're invited, and I am going to make enchiladas, and they are the most cheesy delicious spicy just savory enchiladas you've ever had but if you come over and you say got any sushi i'm not gonna say oh yeah let me whip that up real quick i'm kind of gonna go well i made i made mexican tonight i got margaritas ready i literally have chips and salsa out like i made enchiladas my friend dave across the street makes a mean california roll you, if you want mm -hmm. sushi you should go see dave but you smelled my enchiladas and the next time you want Mexican, you are going to come over to my house because yeah. you know that I make a mean guacamole. It's like, that's what your audition is. Present yes. the dish and the read that you want. And then if they don't want it, they didn't feel like eating that that night. And that's, yeah. Fine. But they will know in their head that that's what they want. Or I'm sure we've all had this experience. You think you want Italian, but then you walk by a burger joint. Oh, I actually do. Man, I could go for a mm -hmm. burger right now. They could come in expecting to want what they expected to want. But man, if you make a good enough dish, you might just convince them to try something else. But yeah. if they don't pick it, it's not you. And you yeah. never had any control over it. So why worry? You know? Mm -hmm. 
also a hard thing you have to learn from experience. It takes forever yeah. to learn that. And I think it is an impossible thing to convey. I think so too. To somebody who's 20. Yeah. <laughs> who's just bright and desperate and Right. Excited. There's a right way to do this. Cause, exactly. Because we want an answer, you know? Subjective. And I think as a lot of um I think a lot of high functioning, intelligent people, you know, a lot of your life system, especially in education, is like there is a way to do things. There is a bit of a step sure. by step process. Do this to do this to do this. Mm -hmm. We have been strung on a line in a big way mm -hmm. of do this to do this to do this to do this. This is this is this is the way. Um yeah. and in a career in the arts, it's like I am sorry, sweetheart. That is not, um, mm -mm. that's not going to happen. Um, and it takes a long time to realize that, that you just have to focus on the journey, not the destination and just yeah. doing your work, doing your work and presenting your work and keeping your eyes up and redefining, uh, redefining success has been a big part of like my emotional health. Oh, I bet. In the last like five or 10 years. Um, yeah. Just being open to new things, being open to taking wins where you didn't used to. You know, yeah. Anytime you get a good response from anybody is a win. And every callback is a win. Every avail is a win. Totally every win is a win. It doesn't booking the job is the icing on the cake. Yeah, but like enjoy your cake. You did well. They liked your read. You got called back. Oh, you were you were considered. It was between you and this other person. It didn't go your way. That's okay. It's as much of a win. The only thing missing, unfortunately, is the validation and the check. Right. Um, <laughs> both of which are important for various reasons. But yes. realizing that, it makes your next audition go better. I think so, too. It makes your next 10 auditions go better, I think. Yeah. I, I, I've had people ask me if I'm um, – I've had people ask me if I'm in the program, like in um, AA or NA sure. or something. Because I – and I, and I do not happen to be in either of those programs. But I use mm -hmm. a lot of their language because I find totally. it to be really, really helpful. Like – Agreed. A serenity prayer, you know, mm -hmm. accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, wisdom to know the difference, right? 100%. That's being an artist. Yeah. You can change how hard you work on something. So change it. Work harder. Study more. Try to be better. You cannot change getting booked for something. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about it. Don't spend an ounce of your energy on something you can't control and learn which things you can control and which things you can't. I started to just feel better. Yeah. After that. I was sending the reads I wanted to send. I was taking the risks I wanted to take. Talking about a previous guest, Walt, Walt Gray, um, uh -huh. a, good, a good friend of both of ours. The best. I've known him since I was 16 years old. I Dude, that. I love that guy. I'm jealous you've known him that long. He is the best. Yeah, we went to uh, an arts camp together in high school called that has since been defunded. Thanks a lot, assholes. <laughs> um, but the Pennsylvania Governor's School for the Arts, which was an initiation and tuition free application process sponsored by the state cross-disciplinary poets writers ceramicists spoken word artists dancers musicians what? oboe players fucking scenic designers actors singers everybody two millions of disciplines you'd apply and if you got accepted five weeks room and board and tuition at a college in erie being taught by like college professors in your discipline and doing cross-disciplinary stuff. I, I can't, saying it out loud 20 years later, yeah. I cannot believe that it existed. Like It shined too bright. It was an oasis. It, it, yeah. truly, it truly, it truly, it was way too good to keep existing. Surely we had to, you know, not repair potholes well at the <laughs> yeah. Pennsylvania or spend money on cops or some other bullshit sure. instead of this beautiful, wonderful, amazing thing. That's where Walt and I met. That's cool. But Walt, Walt is uh, lovely and amazing and he helps me read um, a lot for when I have to put myself on tape or something. He's often like, he did that I for me on. as well. Amazing. Earlier this year. Yeah. That's my reader. I mean, it, yeah. Yeah. That's, he's the best. that's, he, he, first of all, he's the best. He's so supportive. He always drops everything, but like he really enables me and reminds me to do the thing that you have to do with a lot, especially a lot of these, these smaller, these small guest star, these co star parts for TV. It's like, uh huh. You can't do this right. Don't right. be too precious about the fucking guy at the office who has two jokes and then a look at the end of the scene. Take a risk. Do something dumb. Do something fun. Do something weird. Yeah. Do something different. Do something different. Make a choice and forget about it. Have fun. Present present them something. Yeah. Because they're going to see a million guys try to do it right. And they might pick one of them. But you didn't have control over being that, even if you did do it right. So why not have more fun? True. Just, like, just leave it on the table. I agree. I think I think you book more doing that. And even if you don't, you control the only thing you have control over, which is you feel better about that send. Right. I rarely feel good about a safe send. 
totally i almost always feel good when it's like yeah i thought that was that was cool that was like risky but no i think that's the way it should have gone that was cool i'm glad i sent that one yeah you don't think about it over the weekend which is the only goal yeah you just have to put yourself in a position where it's like i sent my read i sent my tape and now i get to move on with my life you did your thing cool and then every piece of good news is a pleasant surprise you're not waiting around refreshing your email because you're going, well, who fucking knows if that was, who knows if that was I, know. they do. I thought it was funny. Uh, Walt thought it was funny. So that's, I'm really just trying to please Boom. Walt. That's really, yeah, nice. so Walt, am I. trying to please you, man. Yeah, I absolutely. I found, it's a good metric to go by. Please. If, Walt's, if Walt's happy, please I'm happy. Please validate me, Walt. <laughs> please. I need it. <laughs> you know, speaking of funny doing your things, how, who came up with Pursued by Bear? That's a great question. Uh, my wife did. Um, Genius. Uh, Pursued by Bear was the uh, the sketch comedy group that um, myself all and her. Them. Man, you do your homework. I don't mess around, this, Craig. This fucking, this fucking guy. He's, <laughs> he's 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 the expert here. Yeah. Um, I'm the Craig Lee Thomas expert. You're, yeah, you, you truly are the Craig Lee Thomas <laughs> expert, which I appreciate. Um, it's about time somebody was. <laughs> right. uh, my wife came up with it. Um, her and I and uh, Kelly Landry, who is an amazing stand-up comedian and showrunner and director and writer and just all around fantastic person um we went to college with her and she lives here in la now she's like part of our la family we did that for a number of years when we first moved out here just shooting writing and shooting and directing and i love acting it. in our own sketches and stuff and um pursued by bear as as you, you may know uh, shakespeare's most famous stage direction um mm -hmm. in the winter's tale um antigonus delivers a long monologue should i leave this baby on a beach or not and everything no don't <laughs> you maniac what the fuck are you talking about and he <laughs> Exits pursued by bear is the Amazing. is the written in the folio stage direction exit pursued by bear, which we just thought was really funny. Amazing. So we're like, yeah, we're all a bunch of nerds. Kelly and I went to Adler, and Lisa went to Strasbourg and studied Shakespeare a bunch when she was at NYU as well. Um, so we're like, ah, th yeah, this is our thing. This this will be our thing. Well, um, and yeah, that was a such an education. Oh yeah, out here like making your own work it's where lisa realized that she was a fantastic director which she now does she you know, definitely um, is yeah um she uh we all started writing together and she sort of ended up directing more of them more often than not or we would cool. bring people in and she'd be like man i th this person you know that i'd like to do this so that's what sort of spurred her i think to pursue um writing and directing full time as opposed to acting that and um she has an amazing anecdote about it. she did she did some background work when she moved, first moved out here and um the late great bill paxton ah uh, yeah rest in peace yeah one of, i mean jesus one of the best to ever do it he was the executive producer of that show in the lead and mm. lisa 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 has the story of standing behind a flat waiting to enter and i guess like she was in the hospital or something they were supposed to enter together or she was supposed to like chase him sure as like a background actor and bill was amazing i mean she says that he would eat with the background actors he introduced himself to everybody just the loveliest warmest most wonderful person oh, so she's cool. standing back there and they're like chatting it's not weird he's just being a nice guy but he's wondering what is going on he doesn't quite know when his cue is and like a pa kind of comes in and like barks at him he's like apologize oh, okay, i don't know this and lisa says like i was standing i'm like this is one of the oh, this is a national treasure actor yeah <laughs> <laughs> the executive producer of the show and the lead and he has no idea what's going on <laughs> And Lisa said, I, I need to know what's happening. I need to be the one making decisions. I need to be the one calling shots. I yeah. think I need to, I need to direct. I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't sit around and be told what to do. I got to tell people what to do, which I think is really cool. That's amazing. Bill Paxton. Yeah. Bill Paxton and, and doing sketches, just shooting. Yeah. You know, dumb, dumb little videos, begging the bars that we worked at to yeah. give us the space <laughs> on off days for free so that we could have a location to shoot at. I love it. I got to say, last words of uh, Rutherford Grant is my favorite. I enjoy last words as well so because funny. it's very stupid. <laughs> it um, is. It's so dumb. It's really, really <laughs> dumb. I think as as all great sketches start with, yeah. just one one really stupid subversion of an expectation. <laughs> yeah. Basically, the entire gist of this sketch is: What if somebody's dying words were not "Please treasure my memory forever"? I want you to be happy. But what if somebody's <laughs> dying words were "Don't fuck anybody else"? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and that's it and you, you're done it's so I mean, funny <laughs> you write something like that and like obviously you have to keep writing all the rest of the jokes but like it's over once you yeah once you come up with a <laughs> stupid idea you just you've you've crafted the bell yeah and now you just ring it as many times as you think you can get away with um yep. 
and I was in. Michael Olivier is fantastic in that sketch. He's another Agreed. really good friend of ours uh, from here in LA, and he, he's you know in every television commercial you've ever seen because he's gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> um, so many movies and TV shows and every other damn thing. He was on Glee for a while. He's on everything. Um, he's so freaking funny. Kelly is hilarious in that, and I wear a big top hat and am a moron. So yeah, it's the making. It's the making. It's the. the it's sketch. all the magic in one. It really is. It really is all the magic one. I, I miss doing that. Um, you know, the world has moved on. Um, uh huh. In our post funny or die internet 4.0 you know uh -huh. tiktok kind of world but it, it was really fun to like plan to do a shoot and like fill out the sag paperwork and like sure do catering and invite your friends and cast people and do all the contract like that it was very fun and it definitely felt it felt very real um, I bet. because it was real it was really fun yeah just a good time because how many did you do like six or seven you did a lot we did it i mean yeah we did a bunch some of them we have excised from the internet yeah. <laughs> just for for various reasons just like yeah let's clean up the presence a little bit but yeah i mean we um yeah at least six or seven big ones um a lot of which like lisa got into a bunch of film festivals which was super fun cool. so that sort of introduced us to like the film festival thing sure we to, like, travel for different festivals and we met a lot of people and able to watch a lot of different shorts and stuff cool. which i think was really helpful for her in her come up of now, you know, writing and producing like dramatic shorts and narrative shorts and writing yeah. screenplays and writing features and stuff. That was sort of like, that was the genesis of all that. Um, okay. And just having, you know, it, when, when you move out here and you don't have anything on your reel. Yeah. Got to make, make one, make something, make yeah. something happen, you know? And these days, you know, making quote unquote content is easier than it used to be because of sure technology and social media and stuff. But you know, you know, back, back then it was like, yeah, you, you had to be a weekend warrior. You know, what? what yeah. Oh, we we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna shoot this this weekend and then edit it ourselves and you know figure out friends that can give us one of their band songs or something like. Just a lot of that. It was a very, uh, a very sort of like babes in arms romantic. Yeah. Let's get the gang together and do a short <laughs> yeah. um, kind of thing, which was super fun. Which I miss sometimes. It was, it was, it was good times. I love it. And I, I, I think that is a, a separation between a lot of actors is the ones that like wait for the phone to ring and ones that are like, well, I'm going to not I'm going to make my own things in the meantime. I, not everybody Absolutely. does that. No. And I I mean, th that is something that I think it is OK to just like beat over the head of anybody who's an artist yes. that you meet. Just like you have to do your own thing. You have totally. to be totally. And if, you, and if you don't want to, like, do you really want to do this if you don't have the creative fire to make something happen like is this what you want to do or is it right acting is fun agreed unless agreed. you have paralyzing stage fright or you're just really mm -hmm. not into it it's a good time there's a reason community theaters exist there's a reason mm -hmm. why offices do sketches for christmas parties there's a reason why we do karaoke it's fun to yeah. perform totally as people we enjoy it but it's like it's that's not enough to make it um a good idea for it to be your livelihood right most of, as we as we talked about earlier most of acting is not acting most of being yeah. an artist is not working it's it's all the other stuff um mm -hmm. and yeah you have to be you have to be putting yourself out there in a I way i think so too um because no i say this i say this to my students all the time i try to say this to myself too it's like nobody needs you yeah. nobody needs you to do this the industry does not True. require you they're they're good they've got enough people to do mm -hmm. it and i don't feel like that's a discouraging idea i don't mean it to be discouraging it's just true they yeah. don't need you but you can make them want you yeah you can put yourself in a position where you could you could change that but you do not do that like you said by waiting by the phone you do not do that by waiting bob bergen i mean jesus i just i'm just a bob bergen quote machine rightfully so um, uh, yeah he always says you have to agent your agent you know, you have to do the work that your agent does because they're making 10% of your check and you're making 90. Mm -hmm. So how should the work be divided? The work should be divided. You should be 90% of your career and your agent should do 10. You know? mm -hmm. And I think that that's another important thing to try to like, try to put forward to people because then, then you enjoy the journey more too. You know, it's not fun to sit by the phone and it's not fun to wait for an email. It's very fun to get together with your friends and read a play. Yeah. It's very fun to do a stupid short or to join an improv team, or to write a sketch show, mm -hmm. or to sing a song, or do any dumb stuff. It's fun to do those things. And you're getting better as you're doing them. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the other chestnut is always, you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right? 100%. So you could get the opportunity, but if you haven't been keeping yourself sharp, you're sharp, you're not going to get lucky. Yeah. You know? It's true. It's both. You got to put yourself out there, and you got to be ready when the opportunity does come a call in.
as it yeah. were. And that's, I think, that's that's true of a lot of people that are successful. I think um, the unifying factor is like a, a desire to put themselves out there and a desire to collaborate and a desire to create too, because that's our job. Agreed. I say this to my students all the time too. All the time too, they get up to the mic and I say, tell me a story. Tell yeah. me a story. That is your job. You're not reading this line. You're not reading this McDonald's commercial. Right. Tell me a story. This piece of copy is telling a story. So it's our responsibility to bring that to life. Yeah. Whether that's Chekhov or a progressive commercial or <laughs> two lines on General Hospital or whatever. Like, yeah. Tell me a story. I agree. How'd you get into video games? Because it's a different medium than the previous ones you've been messing with. It's very different. Yeah. Through, I mean, voiceover is so funny because, um, it's like it's it's a it's a door to a room with a lot of doors. I think you open that door and you realize like, oh shit, this is like a labyrinth of hallways here. Like, there's so many things that could be done. Yeah, um, from this and like everybody's way in is different. But video games are out there. I think it it was something I wanted. Um, it's something I'm passionate mm -hmm. about. I'm I'm a you know, I'm a elder millennial. Grew up an indoor kid played video games vociferously my entire life and i still do mm -hmm. um so it's it's it never hurts that you enjoy the medium um sure you know my my agent has a lot of connections in the video game world and has a lot of amazing video game actors on their roster mm -hmm. so th they are somebody who have relationships with a lot of the casting directors and the directors and the studios and stuff so like it's going across their desk. They're seeing it, but right. you know, first, first six months or a year that I was with my agency, I don't think I ever auditioned for a video game. Really? Because that's, oh, absolutely not. And I think that's a pretty common experience. Like a lot of, you, you get signed and my first agent, I was with Abrams was my first agency. So Got pretty it. big, pretty big outfit. Yeah. Um, I was hired, I not hired, I was signed to, to do the reads for like the late twenties guys who were funny in commercials. Sure. Because that's what they needed. That was the deficiency they had, which is the reason that they signed me. You know, sure. Um, I would say first thing, first thing my agent, who's still my agent, said to me was, "Oh, I hated your demo." I was like, oh, <laughs> no. but "I liked your sound." I was like, "Okay, cool. Then you like my demo? Well, I don't okay. know. They did the job. I'm here." That's a lot of mixed signals. <laughs> so, yeah, but that's okay. Um, and he just had me read for like every single Jack in the Box and McDonald's and you know State Farm commercial that was up. Sure, and I did well enough. They're like, "Yeah, I think you know how to turn. You know how to navigate a turn." You know how to find a reversal. You know how to tell a joke. Right. And that's what he needed from me. So you that's had that what timing. he gave me. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I have that uh, timing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that's what they needed from me. So that's what they sent me out for. But, you know, you book a couple spots or you do well, they start throwing you bones. You know, they're going to throw sure. you, ah, this animated character is you. So we'll let you read on that. Or like, eh, there you go. You know, a couple people didn't read on this, and we have five more slots. So yeah, let's let I'll let you swing on this. We'll throw you a bone. Why not? Here. Yeah, why Got not? Got nothing to lose by it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and and I studied up. You know, I took classes with Richard Horvitz and took classes with oh, Winger. Amazing. Yeah, uh, some really amazing people, and started to realize like, oh shit, like, man, this thing I really like. I'm a couple steps away from applying for these jobs i should like pursue this more and i let my agents know like hey i'm interested in you know trying to do more of this and even then you know it took me a long time a lot of swings and a lot of misses yeah before, before i started booking um video games um it was only a couple of years ago that i booked my first game mm -hmm. uh, which is still not out um, <laughs> which classic is the other, yeah the other irony of you know i've done how many dozens in the interim a lot of which have come out, a lot of which are coming out or will come out. In the mm -hmm. future. But like, yeah, that first game, still waiting on that. Really? On that first one. <laughs> yeah. Um, just because of the timing and the dev cycle and stuff. You know, sure. Things get shuffled around and whatnot. But man, it's, it's video games are the sweet spot for me. I mean, yeah. It's just like, it's everything I like about voiceover, which is like bringing the technique and the technical to the emotive and the instrumental, bringing that into the performance. And also just like, just it's f action it's fun it's swinging yeah. swords and firing laser guns and dying and jumping and all the other bullshit it's just yeah it's just a blast like i i i pinch myself every time i do a game because there's at least one point in every single session even the most quote-unquote boring or the most vocally strenuous or the most like oh, i really didn't feel like doing this today like there's one point where i just I'm like i cannot believe i'm getting paid to do this yeah this is insane Everybody in this room is getting paid so that you can listen to me 
pretend to get lit on fire. Yeah. <laughs> run off of a cliff. Right. Cool. Great. <laughs> this yeah. is this is awesome. Like, um, so I mean, it's it's one of the it's one of my just things I'm most grateful for in my career slash life is that I am able to work so much in video games now because it it brings a lot of it together for me. Um, yeah, it's it's such a good time. It's so fun and it's always different, you know, not just genre to genre, but like game type to game type and storytelling style to storytelling style. It's just like I'll do a game where all I do is thank people for bringing me soup. And yeah. suggest that we go to a party <laughs> and then have five different reactions for standing there bored. Hmm. Uh, huh? <laughs> and then, you know, the next day you're doing a session, it's like, oh, you're just screaming. Just like you, right. <laughs> you're in a helicopter and all you're doing is screaming and throwing grenades at people. Like, great. yeah, I mean, there, there's and everything in between. You know, there's a lot of opportunity for just on the fly decision making because of like the sure. Just, just because of the nature of it, especially if you're localizing something like the, the 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 boss is not the director and it's not the game developer, it's not anybody. The boss is the clock. Right. Because <laughs> like we have this many cues, we have this much time. We need to go now. Yeah. Like, like there's not a lot of time to craft your performance sure. in video games a lot, which I think is really fun. Yeah. Because it somebody's scrolling on an Excel document, you're reading a line for the first time. Mm -hmm. And three seconds later, you have to say it three different ways. And that's terrifying to people. It's terrifying sure. to me. I mean, I, I didn't realize that that's what it was until I booked my first game that was like that. Sure. That first session of like, we have you for four hours and we're just going to get as much done as we can. And if we have extra time at the end, we'll go, well, what else can we make him do? Hey, yeah. we have five minutes. Can you read these 10 lines as a dwarf, but you can't sound like Gimli because we'll get sued, but it has to be Gimli enough that this conveys that you're a dwarf and it has to be different enough from those other six characters you did, all of which you just did for the first time today. Do you remember what this sounded like? Okay, go. And like, <laughs> I was having a panic attack during I that bet. session and I was imposter syndrome going off like crazy, just worried about yeah. having done a good job. But now, like, I love doing that kind of stuff because- that's where you learn the thing we're talking about. It's like, okay, fuck it. Yeah. Right. Make a choice. Say yes. Don't look back. And it's so it. fun to find it as you go and give them alts and find a weird way to say it and make them laugh. You know, yeah. my goal in any session on my B take is for them to go, God damn it. Can I use that? <laughs> There's no way they'll let me use that. Right. Not ah, just alt it. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if they let me do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's mostly my goal is doing something that's so weird that they have to want to use it. And when yeah. I hear one of when I hear one of those lines make it into a game, that's very gratifying. Um, I love it for me. I got a couple of B takes into uh, Star Wars Squadrons. Yeah, which, like, at the time was like one of the biggest games I'd ever done. Yeah, I bet. The team was so nice. Director was so amazing. Everybody was working on that was so incredible, and they were awesome about it. just like, yeah, man, like give us a take that works, and then try something. You know, cool. and most of the time, like, <laughs> that was really funny. Yeah, there's no way that's going to be A. We can't take that B. Oh, yeah. wow. Really love that B read. Yeah, there's no way we can use that. I'll take the A. <laughs> every once in a while, like, ah, oh, can I keep the B? Yeah, keep the B, Alt the A. We'll see what they take. And then nice. playing the game and hearing the two or three was like, they convinced <laughs> EA to accept that insane line reading. That's I very, love it. Very gratifying for me because I think it, it makes it makes the character more interesting. You know, yeah, it had to have been so fun. I mean, it's a hot shot pilot, literally. Yeah, it's I mean, so that, cool. That was definitely. Um, I mean, the, the way that the way the logistics of these things work is, you know, it, it, the code names have code names and the NDAs sure. have NDAs. So you audition for something that's called something completely different. You get a character reference, five mm -hmm. adjectives. And all the lines. And the character photo reference for that, one of them was Han Solo. And I was like, oh, oh these motherfuckers. Boom. Look at these motherfuckers. Who do they think they are? <laughs> oh, right. yeah. I bet you want it to be Han Solo. Because uh. you don't know. <laughs> right. You don't know that it is Star Wars asking you this. But, I mean, that that's the dream. You just, yeah. Oh, I just get to be a cocky son of a bitch. Great. Yeah. Amazing. But, um... I think I think that's the reason I booked that job is because my f Harrison Ford is one of my absolute favorite actors. Like I, I like right Star Wars. So. I love Indiana Jones. Oh, I feel you. Indiana Jones is like my Indiana Jam for yeah. sure. Um, and I think it's it, it's the best. It's the best like 
every man hero performance on film because my favorite thing yeah. about Indiana Jones is that he's human and he's yeah. weak. He's a dude. He's gets not knocked out all the time. Guy. He gets his <laughs> ass kicked. He gets hurt. He's vulnerable. He mm -hmm. famously is very afraid of something like. Yeah. And Harrison Ford is such a badass, but like he he does he does not present his ego in that performance. Yeah. Because Agreed. Indiana Jones would be a hateful, cocky son of a bitch mm -hmm. if he didn't have all that weakness and he didn't have all that vulnerability. Yeah. So even just seeing that, and he has a little bit of that as Han, a little bit less. But that was what I was like, okay, cool. I am this guy, but like, if I'm getting missile shot at me, I'm going to panic. And if I'm yeah. blowing up, I'm going to be freaking out and vulnerable. Um, And I think that that was kind of the salt to the sweet that made that part work. Yeah. You can't just do the one thing. You got to be the guy, but every oh fuck, every once in a while, show a little bit of vulnerability because that makes you likable. It makes you yeah. understandable. Totally. And everyone else is going to do that one note, you know, cocky pilot. But then if you exactly. add a layer, exactly. Sets you apart. Yeah. I think that, and I think, I think being funny, that's the other thing I yeah. love about video games. I've almost never, I don't know that I've ever worked on a game where it didn't come up at least once that it, it behooved me to be funny. It behooved That's cool. me to tell a joke. Like, there's always room for levity. There's yeah. There's always room. And it, not on every line, obviously. Sure. But there's going to be something that comes up where if you can make the director laugh, that's the best read. Yeah. Even in a deadly serious game. Sure. There's jokes in Last of Us Part Two. Right. That game is devastating. Like, <laughs> yeah, it the is. The most important piece of art created in the last 10 years, in my opinion. Agreed. But Agreed. it's funny. Yeah. Every one of those characters is funny at some point. Yeah, that's and a good point. Yeah. That's another fun it's it's just another fun thing about video games. You know, I I did two sessions yesterday and you know, I, I finished the set the tick back like, yep, yep, I app yep, I that one character had a joke. Oh, that about that session. Yeah. Kind of the whole premise of that scene that we were doing was that it was a little bit funny. Sure. It's just it's always there. It's always there. And I think under understanding that. And giving yourself permission to throw that into reads keeps you from giving these like aggro edge lord. Sure. Samey, I'm a badass. It's like, yeah, you are a badass, but you're a person. Yeah. Make a human being, not a caricature. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And going back to going back to the other tech going back to other technique, you know, if you are a person, the you know, the magic if. That's yeah. why I love other technique so much. If mm -hmm. I, I this is the entirety of my process. If this is true, what else is true? Because that's yeah. that's Adler's magic if. Okay, if you are a barbarian, what else does that mean? It right. means a million other things. It doesn't mm -hmm. just mean I'm badass and I sound like this. It means that you came from somewhere mm -hmm. and that that shaped you in some way and that you have wants. Yeah. You have a want. You have an objective. You have relationships with people. If I'm talking to this person, well, what else is true? How does that change the way I speak? How does that change the way I stand? How does that change the way I breathe? Yeah. What just happened before? Why am I saying this? What's about to happen? What am I doing while I'm saying this line? I tell my students all the time, video game auditions especially, I think, are like 70% writing and 30% performance. Yeah. Checks out. You have, you have to put all of that stuff either on the page or in your brain, and it all has to make it into the MP3. And if they can't right. hear it, this is a Mick Winger thing. If they can't hear it, it doesn't exist. Right. You could be doing the most beautiful, emotive acting possible in the booth, but for voiceover, that period of silence is yeah. nothing. Nothing happened, but it's right here, <laughs> that's something. Even just yeah. connecting it to breath, something's going on with that character. There's activity or there's emotional turns or processes happening, but you got to hear it. And it feels a little indicating sometimes yeah. to a TV actor. Sure. If it's honest, listening to it, it's on, it's on your MP3, yeah. which is where it needs to be. Well, it's the same on camera. If it's not in the frame, it doesn't exist. Well, exactly. Yeah, you could you be know? doing the most beautiful acting. It's like, oh, well, you're you're out of frame or you're out of focus or you mm -hmm. didn't hit your light or you didn't hit your eye line. You know, it's about, it's always truth. It's always truth yeah. in imaginary circumstances. It's just about the, it's just, it's just about the medium and about the form. You know, you got to hit the back of the house at Utah Shakes. If they can't hear you mm -hmm. upstairs, then you're not doing a very good job. But gotta be emotionally truthful and subtle enough if the camera's two and a half inches from your face in an extreme close-up and you yeah. gotta put it on the you gotta put it into your breath and into your voice in a voiceover audition because they can't see you yeah do you have a dream role when you have it done yet or like man this is on your actor's bucket list 
That's a great question. I have I have a bunch of I have a bunch of Shakespeare dream okay, roles, most okay. most of which I am most of which I have let go because okay. of just it's just never gonna happen. But I mean, you know, like a lot of a lot of against type things, like uh, I I love Romeo and Juliet. And even when I was the right age, never was the type. I mean, I played Capulet in college. No great okay. surprise. There was yeah. no way that I, there's <laughs> no way that you ever cast me as Romeo. Now I'm 36 years old. I'm a giant, you know. No jawed weirdo. <laughs> it's never going to happen. But You're I the what if, Romeo, if he yeah, had exactly. survived. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I don't feel so good, Mr. Montague. Right. Um, I mean, that I love that play. That's a dream role. It's it's yeah. so hacky and cliche, but ha- Hamlet's a dream role. The, te- the text and the things yeah. you get to do in that oh, part yeah. are just, they're, they're ridiculous. You know, they're absolutely insane. Um, yeah, it's weird. Even though I never work in theater anymore and take no steps to amend or change that sure. thing, I'm I'm fine with it. Like my brain always goes back to my brain goes to like the canon of like theatrical arts when I think of dream role. Yeah, um, I'm not somebody who's like God. I gotta be Spider Man or like oh I need right. like these sort of because we are sort of coming into a world where like there are these sort of established like archetypal characters. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't think it's it's dream roles as much as like dreams, dream stories or dream types of things, dream companies like Naughty Dog. is. Oh, yeah. Like, the pinnacle at that, the moment. Yeah. <laughs> they are the ones telling the stories in the ways that excite me in such a crazy, stupid way. Yeah. Like the idea of getting to be because that, 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 that's the that's the best of all the worlds. Yeah, you're act. You're you're doing you're doing PCAP on the volume. That's you doing improv. Yeah, it's you doing black box theater. It's you doing Shakespeare. This elevated stuff, but then also the voiceover component of it, and also the stage combat and the action. Yeah, part of it. I mean, that's maybe that's what that's what video games are. Video games are everything because they're all the things on my journey that I've enjoyed, kind of like put into that box. Yeah, yeah. It's not about like dream parts as much as just like man like let me be you know the second act antagonist in one of yeah. these big sweeping type of games let me come in and be the guy in the hangar hanging out and then we go on that one mission together like yeah and you know fuck it you know you can be aspirational let me be you know let me be let me be the lead i want to be yeah. you know I can everybody see wants to be troy baker we all do it's, of course it's, everybody wants to be nolan north because they're the best they're the best that do the thing yeah you know? for real you know let me be let me be let me be norman reedus i'll carry that little baby around yeah, you will. <laughs> carry baby all over this land. You've got long arms. You could carry the ghost, baby and the crossbow. Ghost whales and all the other death stranding nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's one. There's one for you. Um, yeah. Um, uh, if if I had to give you one, yeah, I, I think David Hayter should play Solid Snake for the Hell rest yeah. of possible time. Yeah, but I think as soon as it's not possible for him to do it anymore, I should do it. There you. There go. we go. Yeah. There you got go. my that, vote. That's the aspirational, never going to happen dream role. Just I love Otacon. It, Metal Gear, it can't be. Just let me never separate <laughs> my top and bottom teeth and talk on that codec, because that I'm was in. like that was my formative, and still is like my formative video game franchise for sure. Yeah. So Metal Gear for sure. I can't wait to go back to this when that happens to be like, ha! <laughs> <laughs> it was me. <laughs> it was me <laughs> when Craig played Guard Number Six, and he went, "It's just a box." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which would be enough for me. That would uh, Hideo still counts. It, Hideo, still if counts. you're listening. Love your podcast. Yeah. Um, that's enough. I will put on the the balaclava. I always call that a baklava because I'm a fucking idiot. Um, I'll put on that ski mask. I'll eat. I'll eat. That's ba- why. I'll, that is true. It's it's noon. I'll eat baklava with you, Hideo. And um, yeah, yeah. Anything. We'll make it happen. Anything in that. Anything in that world. I love it. Hey, now Craig. We've been talking for an hour and a half. You survived, my friend. Oh my gosh, we Look made it this. through. Look at this. Dude, I could have talked to you for days. <laughs> I could have talked to you for days. It was this such was a treat so to fun get to hang out with you, man. It was the it was the absolute best. I can't tell you how um how chuffed as yes, the Brits good would say I was that you even asked. Um, of course, I mean, I love I I'm I'm a fan of the podcast. You know, ever since I met you, I've been listening. It's been it's been my no. traffic my traffic podcast. No, and, uh, stop it. I'm editing you're fan- this you're, out. No, you're you're fantastic at this, and <laughs> I mean. It, it, much like when I look at the cast list of a lot of games, I'm in, I look at the I look at the list of other guests. I'm like, good idea. I have no fucking idea why he let me in this <laughs> company, but I am happy to sully the reputation. Right. I am happy to bring <laughs> to bring the the average um, yes it factor of your guests down by a by a factor of perhaps double digits. It, it was yeah. my pleasure to do See, so. 
you messed up by saying hi to me at a party. That's what happened. You and sealed again, your you sealed your fate right there. Yeah, we talked about this earlier, but <laughs> guys, just just remember, we did we met at a party because uh, we're cool. We, yeah, we, we're so we, cool. We go to we go to cool Hollywood we go to parties. Parties. <laughs> That's yeah. Like, me and you. I, I don't like know parties. about you, but I like to party. Okay. You for I know for a fact you do not party. We like to party. We like to. Party. We like to party. We like to party. The Venga bus is coming. It is. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I actually do have to go catch the Venga bus. Um, yeah, just you do, go catch, you do the indeed. Bus. Yeah, get, get <laughs> yeah. a transfer to the Venga bus. Now, dude, before I release you back into the wild, I have to ask, where can people find you online? Where can they find your stuff? Talk to me. Yeah, I would say, yeah, Um, I think I'm, I think I'm, it's me, Craig Lee, at it's me, Craig Lee. Instagram is the place to mostly find me. I am I'm nav- navigating, as I think a lot of us are, my nascent relationship with Twitter. Because uh, yep. of certain, you know, <laughs> apartheid emerald mind yeah, fuck know. sticks that may or may not be the worst people yep. on the planet. Um, trying to figure out, you know, mm-hmm. oh shit, this was a really easy way for me to talk to a lot of cool people. I got to get a lot of people's email addresses before yeah. I can delete this. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Check me out on Instagram. I'm always posting pictures of my dogs at It's Me. Adorable. Correctly. And if you ever feel like taking a class, hit up Real Voice LA, which is just at Real Voice LA across all channels. Uh, Mike DeLay, the guy who runs that studio that I've been teaching with for a while. We met bartending years ago. Cool. He's been in bands and been an audio engineer his whole life. And he's like, fuck it, I'm just going to do this. And he st- ended up starting a studio that just like has become a really, really amazing community for actors both in LA and across the country because of Zoom. You know, yeah. And um, I'm really, really, really grateful to get the opportunity to meet so many amazing people and get to be a, a very, very, very small part of your journey. If you want to do the voice acting thing, which I think you should, everybody should, everybody should give a shot if you think it's fun. If you do yeah. it and you're like, this sucks, then that's also fine because yeah. it's not for everybody. Don't do it. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I kind of like wearing headphones. Well, then don't do it. Yeah. Not for you, pal. <laughs> but I really appreciate it, Brian. It's such a treat to get to talk to you, man. Of course, dude. Pleasure's all mine. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find my demos, short films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, and Chris. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.